by the all Anandians, President and members of the Ananda College All Boys Association, senior students, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I am indeed privileged and honored to address this distinguished gathering on the special occasion of All Oration 2018, an annual event named in remembrance of Colonel Henry Steele Alcott, who was the founder of our prestigious college, Ananda. First of all, I wish to take this opportunity to thank the principal and Ananda College All Boys Association for this rare honor bestowed upon me, inviting to deliver the memorial speech at this significant moment. When I was invited to attend today's event, I went through a series of fond memories that I experienced as an Anandian. This stage and this podium at Pulratna Auditorium is not a strange place for me. I could still remember <clears throat> the events that I have taken part as a schoolboy in this same auditorium. And I wholeheartedly pay my gratitude to Ananda College, my alma mater, for laying the foundation for any success later in my life. Ladies and gentlemen, next 30 plus minutes or so, I'm going to speak about the Indo-Pacific, the region of global connection. I believe this is a timely pertinent topic which holds a significant value as we are an island nation in Indo-Pacific region. The buzzword of this speech is Indo-Pacific. The term Indo-Pacific has been in the minds of many policy makers and defense experts for decades due to the inherent importance of the region. The increased interpretation of the term Indo-Pacific over the geo graphically more limited Asia-Pacific has extended its importance and interest into many connotations. The modified term Indo-Pacific region bears far-reaching strategic importance. Having this in mind, let me share my views on the three pertinent questions. Alpha, what constitutes the term Indo-Pacific? Bravo, what are the dynamic interests of the Indo-Pacific today? Charlie, what are the shared challenges and opportunities in the region? Ladies and gentlemen, what constitutes the term Indo-Pacific? It's a question that has many answers. It entails unprecedented economic, security, and diplomatic interpretations based on wider national interest of the many global and regional players. The Indo-Pacific has now become a much contested topic in the current geopolitic or geostrategic equations. When we retrospect, the idea of Indo-Pacific has been there for ages in different terms. However, the geographic interest and geopolitical imaginations have dictated and remained persistent in all ages. Traditionally, the Indian Ocean region and the Asia Pacific region were treated as two separate entities, which span over two regions of Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean. Now, there is an increasing tendency to consider these two areas as a single entity. The term Indo-Pacific has recently gained wider official acceptance among many countries due to obvious facts of U.S. President's foreign policy interpretation and the subsequent diplomatic engagements. During his Asia tour in November 2017, the U.S. President, Donald Trump, often used the term Indo-Asia Pacific and the U.S. National Security Strategy, NSS, has also referred to the Indo-Pacific construct. Further, Australian Defence White Paper 2016 has used 
the Indo-Pacific terminology. This term has gained white currency in Japan, India, and in several Southeast Asian countries as well. Thus, confluence of two seas, as implied by the term Indo-Pacific, has led to greater degree of connectivity among many countries. As with Australian Journal of International Affairs, the Indo-Pacific means recognizing that the accelerating economic and security connections between the Western Pacific and the Indian Ocean region are creating a single strategic system. This strategic system can be understood as a set of geopolitical power relationship among nations where major changes in the part in one part of the system affect what happens in the other part. It is evident that the region is the geographical connotation of the area which covers the eastern coast of Africa through Indian Ocean and Western Pacific Ocean. The waters of the Indo-Pacific region represent the largest ocean and the third largest ocean in the world. It is also home for 60% of the world population. Connecting of those two oceans has not only emerged as geostrategically and geoeconomically important, but also important in the field of defense and security. The coastline of the Indian Ocean has a total length of 66,526 kilometers. Further, in the Pacific Sea region, and littoral is marked by a multiplicity of cultures, ethnicities, religions, economic models, mega cities, and government structures. Sea is the common link which binds the subsystem within the Indo Pacific. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now come to the question of what are the dynamic interests of the Indo-Pacific today. The shift from Asia-Pacific into, into Indo-Pacific has written the geostrategic and geoeconomic interests among many nations across the world. The importance of Indo-Pacific term stems from ancient kingdoms to modern day ambitious seafaring nations. This changing use of geographic terms has made many nations to revisit their competing and conflicting interest. The Indo-Pacific region can be considered as the center of gravity for many converging interests. This converging interest transcends from economic geopolitical and security connections between Western Pacific and Indian Ocean region by making well-connected theater of interest. The region is also heavily militarized, which includes seven of the ten largest armies and five of the world-declared nuclear nations are also located in the Indo-Pacific region. Importantly, the maritime powers like the United States, Japan, China, India, South Korea and Australia are also located in the region. The region is also home for three largest world economies and 12 member states of G20 nations. Further, the region is also home for approximately 4 billion people who live under different socio-economic conditions over 36 countries which include the most populous nation and the largest democratic nation. The region is also being highly urbanized and consists of 9 mega cities out of 10, 10 mega urban regions. Thus, the region has become a good marketplace in terms of consumers and investment. Majority of the region's population boom will continue to occupy in the major cities, burgeoning 
the demographic flow. Further, technical innovations in the cyber and digital domains in driving towards faster connectivity bringing the region closer. A region has also been identified to have highest number of internet users, thereby making digitally connected Indo-Pacific. Indo-Pacific region also claims as the engine of global growth, as world's most important trade route lies on the west waters of Indian Ocean. As for the records, Almost half of the world's total annual seaborne trade volumes pass through the Indian Ocean. Especially the goods manufactured in East Asia and distinct for Europe pass through the Strait of Malacca across the Indian Ocean and enter the Suez Canal. Oil supplies bound for China, India, Japan, South Korea and Southeast Asia also move similarly. It should be noted that 50% of the world's container traffic and 70% of the world's crude oil products transit through the Indian Ocean. The Strait of Malacca, which links the Indian and Pacific Oceans, is the shortest sea route between the Middle East and growing Asian markets, notably China, Japan, South Korea and the Pacific Rim countries. Thus, several of the world's top container ports, including Port Kalang in Malaysia, Singapore, and Colombo ports, are located in the Indian Ocean. Further, 40% of the world's offshore natural gas reserves are in the Indian Ocean littoral states, and 55% of the known offshore world oil reserves are in the Indian Ocean. It should also be noted that the continental shelves cover 4.2% of the total area of the Indian Ocean and contains abundance of mineral and natural resources. The region is rich in fish and Indian Ocean processes, some of the world's largest fishing grounds, providing approximately 15% of the total world is catch. According to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, catches taken from the maritime captured fisheries of the Indian Ocean and Western Pacific have increased from less than 20, metric, 20 million metric tons in 1970 to 46 million tons in 2012 over 50%, 57% of the world catch. The existing and to be discovered aquatic resources will be a major factor in meeting huge demands of food and natural resources. These well-known fact that fisheries contribute most of the regional economics, especially in the small island states. Ladies and gentlemen, the region also has some countries that are governed through different political ideologies. Countries that are faced with conflicts, wars of different interests, such as ethnic, religious, social, and political, could also be found in this region. The development of trade and commerce and increased economic prosperity of regional players have made those countries potential powers those can influence the region and its security and or political history. At large, the economic prosperity, technology and strategic competition have made Indo-Pacific a region that changed the future of the world. The Indo-Pacific region is also a witness to multitude of regional organizations, multilateral structures, bilateral and multilateral arrangements, association of Southeast Asian nations known as ASEAN, the ASEAN Regional Forum known as ARF, 
Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, known as APEC, the Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multisectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation, known as BIMSTEC, and South Asia Association of Regional Cooperation, known as SAR, are some of them. This is also a region where we witness great power competition. The Chinese president, Xi Jinping, has proposed one Belt, One Road initiative with the ambition of creating an interconnected and integrated Eurasian continent by way of linking 65 Asian, European and African countries. On the other hand, the United States, Australia, Japan and India are cooperating with each other to face the challenges posed by China. Ladies and gentlemen, let me also focus on some shared challenges and opportunities available to harness stability, peace, prosperity and inclusive growth by way of mutual collaboration. As I deliberated earlier, the Indo-Pacific area remains engine of global growth and what matters here will directly affect for the global peace, security and development. Due to the inherent diversity of the region, it encompasses the fragile and uncertainty in many areas. It evokes multiple strategic challenges in strategic, political and economic domains. Much of challenges remains as non-traditional security threats. However, nuclear deterrence and provocations among major powers have added much volatility into the challenges. Let me now take up a few challenges very briefly. Natural disasters. So, ladies and gentlemen, natural disasters can be considered as the main challenge as the Indo-Pacific region is deeply vulnerable to natural disasters, such as floods, droughts, cyclones, earthquakes, tidal surges, landslides, and tsunamis. Nearly 50% of the world's natural disasters occur in the region and sometimes called as world hazardous belt. What happens in the region affects nearly half of the world. The diagram shows the 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake and the tsunami which considered as one of the world's most disastrous natural event happened in the Indian Ocean which claimed about 200,000 lives. Moreover, Thailand floods in 2011 which estimated damage of US dollar 40 billion. Indian floods in 2014 which estimated damage of US dollar 16 billion and Nepal earthquake in 2015 which estimated damage of US dollar 5.7 billion can be highlighted as some of the high magnitude of disasters. According to the United Nations figures, the region accounts for 57% of the global death toll from natural disasters. Since 1970, an assets worth of $1.3 trillion have been lost between 1970 and 2016. Further, in 2016, 4,987 people died in the region due to disasters. The majority in the floods, 3,250, which hit Bangladesh, China, North Korea, India, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Storms accounted for 188 deaths, and extremely temperature counts 336 deaths as well. In addition, significant climate changes in the region, such as global warming, sea water rising, droughts, and heat waves have also become critical climatic conditions, which creates many negative 
socioeconomic impacts. Sea level rise has threatened the long-term sustainability of coastal communities and vulnerable ecosystems and loss of millions of hectares of arable land. The year 2015 has been reported as the hottest year, which saw several intense heat waves striking India and Pakistan between May and June that resulted in 2,248 and 1,229 deaths respectively. The diagram on the screen shows the world risk in this. As you can see, the region is situated in very high, high and medium risk zones. Now, coming on to the drug trafficking. I would like to emphasize that drug trafficking is another key issue prevailing in the region. And it was found that increasing of illicit drug production, trafficking and transit routes are in the region. Some of the countries in the region produce opium, heroin and cannabis production was found throughout most of the countries in the region. Drug trafficking and transit routes of Asia and Pacific were proliferating and dynamic. Asia is being targeted by drug traffickers because of its economic growth and large youth population. The Pacific is mainly known as transshipment point of drugs entering other countries in the region. As for the United Nations Office of Drug and Crime, UNODC, $90 billion illegal economy in Asia comes from drugs. The Pacific has also become as a right for drug trafficking and transit because most of the countries do not have capacity to patrol their boundaries and territories. The impact on drug trafficking is greatly impact on the national security and human security dimensions. Many countries are now fighting in its full potential to get away from this threat. However, due to the well-connected nature of the trade, many nations require collective efforts to eradicate these threats before it becomes a detrimental threat to the well-being of the societies. Let's look at the screen. The diagram depicts some of the identified trafficking routes. Coming on to the armed trafficking, ladies and gentlemen, illegal firearms trafficking is another issue faced by the region. The impacts of firearms trafficking in the region are wide ranging. It has affected not only regional security and law enforcement but also impacted the areas of human security, education, economic development, and public health. Illicit arms, their parts and components, and ammunition have caused a breakdown of law and order in some countries and represent a greater challenge to sustainable development in some parts of the region. We all remember that we, as Sri Lankans suffered three decades as LTT received weapons through weapon smugglers and extensively using traffickers. Needless to say that drug trafficking and illegal firearms have or share close linkage to terrorism, insurgencies and piracy activities directly or indirectly. Sea piracy has also become an increasingly prominent issue in the region. Anarchy on land created sea piracy, especially in the areas of Horn of Africa and Southeast Asia. Pirate attacks are not random and do not happen by chance. Pirates use the latest technology to target highly valuable ships in highly 
trafficked waters. The waters surrounding the Suez Canal and the whole of Africa are travelled by many ships and are frequently attacked by the Somali pirates. According to the annual State of Piracy report released by the One Earth Futures OEF, Oceans Beyond Policy Program, there were 54 sea piracy incidents in 2017 around Gulf of Aden compared to 27 in 2016. The attacks by the pirates in the waters of the Southeast Asia, stretching from the westmost corner of Malaysia to the tip of Indonesia's, Indonesia's Pinton Island, Malacca, the Singapore, uh, have also been increasing year by year. According to the figures from the International Maritime Bureau of International Chamber of Commerce, there were 42 recorded attacks in 2009. By 2013, it had climbed to 125. Then, overfishing and illegal fishing. Illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, which is known as IUU fishing, can, be, can also be considered as another issue for the Indo-Pacific region as this has caused rapid depletion of fish stocks owing to a combination of overfishing and illegal fishing. As an example, 94% of yellowfin tuna have been overfished and the hills of catch also declined by 90% from the year 2000 to 2015 around the Bay of Bengal sub-region. The practice of IUU fishing has negatively impacted on interstate relations where some of the countries had to deploy their coastal guards and naval assets to prevent such practices. The Indo Lanka fishery issue has become an impediment to sustainable development and human security by creating very negative impact on livelihood of our fishermen in the north. This slide amply illustrates status of poaching in Sri Lankan waters by Indian fishermen. Now conflicts and disputes. Ladies and gentlemen, the region also has long-running territorial disputes. The conflicts in the region can be classified according to the central issue that causes the conflict, the source of, the source of incompatibility. The seven primary sources of incompatibility which encompasses the range of internal conflicts in the India, Indo Pacific region are colonialism, ethnicity, who, ethno nationalism, politics, religions, and territory. When ethnic and religious conflicts are concerned, India, Pakistan, Myanmar, Indonesia, Philippines, and Bangladesh experience different degree of crisis based on various ethnicities and religions. Rohingya crisis emerged in Myanmar in 2015 is one of the prominent crises in the Indo-Pacific region. As for the records of the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, UCHA, by 24th May 2018, there are an estimated 900,000 plus refugees in Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh. And this crisis has become the fastest growing refugee crisis in the world. South China territorial claims, issue of free of navigation, and the conflict in Indonesia is also prominent in the region. The issue of terrorism is a vast subject that should be discussed separately. However, let me just mention that the presence of transnational terrorist networks in the Indo-Pacific region is one of the most destabilizing factors we are facing today. It is one of the negative aspects of global connectivity. Terrorism is using all the avenues of connectivity. 
social media and other forms of technology to disrupt the world order. Ladies and gentlemen, in terms of opportunities and prospects, Indo-Pacific region remains most potential region of collaboration and mutual inclusiveness. No nation would be able to resolve future threats alone due to inherent complexity and trans transnational connectivity. This requires a collective response in order to harness enduring stability, peace and prosperity in the region. Exploring common grounds through consultation, engagement and building collaborative partnership in diplomatic, economic and military domains are vital to convert challenges into opportunities. Sri Lanka, strategic location in Indo-Pacific region. Now let me ask you a question. Is Sri Lanka a small island? Think about it. Please have a look on the screen. Sri Lanka is ranked number 58 in the list of countries by population. By magnitude, Sri Lanka is ranked number 122 out of 195 countries. His Excellency is Kenda Ukhayo. Okay, the first ambassador of the Turkish Republic to Sri Lanka said that you always say that you are a small country because you are comparing Sri Lanka with India. So ladies and gentlemen, our country, Sri Lanka is not a small country when the achievements are concerned. With that in mind, let me very briefly explain you on Sri Lankan perspective on Indo-Pacific region. We all know that Sri Lanka is located at the heart of the Indian Ocean and at the midpoint of the main shipping lane that connects the east to the west. The island is only 10 nautical miles of the world's busiest shipping lane that connects the west to China, Southeast Asia. We are a nation that suffered from brutal terrorism for three decades and now enjoying peace and harmony. I am very proud to announce that Sri Lanka has become a role model to the world as a country which eradicated terrorism. It is actually a great achievement for all peace-loving nations. Since 2009, we have not experienced a single shot of fire or incident due to unprecedented commitment of our armed forces and unimaginable post-conflict efforts and realistic reconciliation mechanism implemented by the government to ensure that all citizens of the country live with peace and dignity. As of now, in light of the regional and global developments, the government has embarked on a number of efforts to leverage Sri Lanka's strategic location for a win-win situation to make our country the hub of the Indian Ocean. Our armed forces are always committed to ensure secure sea line of communication to foster peace, prosperity and development in the region. As the commander of the Sri Lanka Army, now I wish to share what your army does to ensure sustainable peace within our territory. Since the end of the conflict, the Sri Lankan Army has worked in the full spectrum of post-conflict military activities such as demining, resettlement of IDPs, socio-economic and infrastructure developments for IDPs and the Tamil community in the form of conflict areas. 
our commitment and expertise in these areas are visible to strong civil military relationship within the hearts and minds of the people. Through our experience, we have introduced, through our experience, we have introduced engagement and assistance policy to convince the people that military is the best partner for sustainable peace and prosperity. It is observed that 80% of the population in the conflicted areas is with the military forces today. Successful rehabilitation program which rehabilitated over 12,000 ex-militants and their reintegration to the society has become again a model to other nations in the region to follow. All these endeavors are aimed at preventing re-emerging of radical extremism movement in this country. Ladies and gentlemen, finally, it is not worthy to say that today we all enjoy peace and harmony due to the unparalleled dedications and commitments made by our armed forces. If I am more specific on the Sri Lanka Army's contribution towards the noble cause of bringing peace and normalcy to our beloved motherland, 20,000 474 army personnel were killed in action. 3,488 missed in action. 37,000 injured in the battlefield. The pitiful fact is some became permanently disabled. They selflessly committed to ensure sovereignty and territorial integrity of our country through which they have paid their gratitude towards the motherland and they are no more indebted to the country. Sri Lanka being the only country to eradicate terrorism from its own soil in the modern history created a harmonious living condition for its citizens. As Sri Lankans, today we can be proud over this achievement gain as a nation. At present, there is about 21 to 22 million population in our country and it can be productively utilized if it is managed with a far-sighted vision. Further, as a nation, we have been greatly recognized for the higher literacy rate. We will establish education system an agriculture-based economy which is now transitioning towards more urbanized, oriented manufacturing and services. In addition, we have great historical and cultural heritage and core values among the people which have made us honored and recognized. Over the years, we have made significant progress in the socio-economic and human development indicators as well. When we evaluate all such indicators, we can realize sustain, sustainable development is not a dream for us. As I said during my speech, developed countries like China, Japan, Australia, Singapore have reached the destination through the commitment of their citizens. What we have to do is to thoroughly understand our prime responsibility as a nation. It is our duty to utilize available human and natural resources, knowledge and technology effectively to expedite our development process. As individuals, we should think, act and set an example for others to follow. So that we have to change our attitudes, inculcate core values such as discipline, integrity and loyalty and be determined to commit 
in the best interest of the nation. Our younger generation is the future of our country. We being the adults should guide our youth population to be healthy, productive and effective because their contribution is instrumental in driving our motherland towards prosperity. If the youth are taught the core values, employed and managed properly, many a favorable benefits could be gained whilst preventing the issues which may emerge in upcoming years. Ladies and gentlemen, please, please touch your heart, think over your journey so far and ask from yourself, how have you committed towards my country? How I ever paid my respect towards my country? Do I have true passion to transform my country to a developed country? Do I have co-values? Am I invited to my country? Think again and be the change. Think again and be the change.